All right, hi guys. Uh, so the whole point of this lab is it's going to give you a nice um, uh, overview of raw security technologies. Um, what is a requirement to do participate is a laptop with SSH uh, client and a web browser, of course. Uh, without that, you're literally just going to be um, just reading the lab docs. So um, it's going to be. I'm going to talk and introduce the environment like for five ten minutes, and then that, that then you guys are. You guys can jump around, and I'll, I'll go through that. You guys can jump around, do whatever you want in terms of the lab extras. There's about 11, 11 uh, secure security technologies that you're going to see. 10 or 11, I can't remember if it was 10 or 11. And, um, and so you guys can jump around and do whatever uh, lab technology that you would like to do. So first of all, um, quick introduction. Um, do you guys want to go first? So hello, my name is Lucas Ravens. I'm uh, working on SO Linux technology at Red Hat and maintaining SO Linux policies for Red Hat Enterprise Linux and Fedora. Hello, my name is Daniel Kupeček. Uh, I work in a special projects team. I'm working on USB Guard, I8, uh, and NVDN on your security software. So my name is Lucy Kerner. Um, I'm uh, working uh, for on security across the Red Hat portfolio uh, from a uh, from a your corporate standpoint in terms of, okay, what is our internal messaging for security? Like, what, is, what do we want to say about, you know, so security across the entire Red Hat portfolio in terms of as a differentiator for Red Hat? Okay, then, then you can say, well, you're not a security company. You don't sell security products. What does that even mean? And the, the idea is that we have security built into our technologies from Red Hat Prize Linux uh, and also all the way up the stack to help developers build security into their application, management portfolio to uh, automate security and compliance, uh, things like that. So that's the idea. Um, so I create the messaging, also technical content um, for like labs like this, working with uh, engineering, you know, highlighting all the uh, create, uh, things that our engineers create and um, showing, uh, showing the security benefits of our technology. So that's, that's, a, that's at a high level what I do. I spent three years actually in the field uh, as a cloud solutions architect for US public sector. So uh, using our tech, uh, I helped our public sector customers in the US uh, use our cloud products, OpenShift, Ansible, Satellite, etc. cetera, um, in a very, you know, of course, US public sector, um, they are very sensitive to security in terms of the, the very strict security requirements. So, and I helped create like proof of concepts uh, for those kinds of use cases. So that's a high level what I do. So the, um, I'm going to jump to this section. So the lab doc is here. Everyone must do lab zero. That's setup steps. After that, you can do whatever lab you want to do. This lab, everybody has their own unique lab environment. Every lab exercise is its own VM, which means that they will not override each other, OK? So the idea here is do lab zero. After that, if do whatever other lab exercises you want. This is self-paced. The lab environment is going to be on. I, I have it automatically shut down and, and die at uh, 6 p.m. tonight. So if you want to you know, take this not here, but go somewhere else and do it, I don't care. right? It's, just, it's, all, it's all cloud hosted. Um, and that's it. So we're, after that, uh, you know, we're, the lab de the instructions that you'll see is very, very detailed. Uh, so you just go at your own pace, do whatever lab exercise uh, uh, you want to do, and then we're here to answer your questions. Thank you. Go to this link, go to lab zero, and then after, do everybody do lab zero. Then after that, you do whatever other lab you want to do. And then, you know, if you have questions, uh, of course, raise your hand.
It's right there. Oh, okay. Yeah, it, so that was just an example. Right. You just use that exact thing. Okay. Yep. Is it assumed that they're going to do all the laugh during the session or just one? It's up to you. So it's, it's like whatever interests you. It, you don't have to go in any order. They're, they're all independent mm -hmm. from each other. To do the whole thing, um, I don't know, maybe three hours. It depends on the person, too. Some people are low Linux much better than others, right? Uh, so it depends. The goal was not necessarily for you to finish all right now. The goal is kind of just introduce you to raw security technologies as a whole. Who needed a laptop is not here. Let me. Oh, you did already. Okay. Okay. Who has the longest arm? You, right? You have the longest arm. Okay. Get the audience. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Sorry, that might be a stupid question. It's okay. But the GUIs page says to press reset workstation. Oh, don't do that. Don't do that unless you want a new GUI. So then, yeah, the, it, only if you wanted to get. So it doesn't. Yeah, don't. You don't need to do that right now. Yeah. That's that's only if you wanted to get another GUI. You have to restart the reset it, but don't you don't need to do that for this. You just need one good. That's it. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. No, this one, middle one. Get the audience with us.
already done for you. This is just FYI, already done for you. FYI, so you just start here. Right there. Yeah, you do. Yeah, see, lab user. You, you see GUID here? The GUID you got from lab zero, insert that here. Okay. Nope, pa I put password up there. Yep. Okay. Uh huh. Okay. Which one do you want to do? Okay. And so let's say I have to connect to this. All right. Mm -hmm. Instead of this, mm -hmm. put in your GUID. Yeah. Okay. And Can I see the good? Hey, this is your borrowed laptop or your laptop? It says SSH. Oh, you have it twice, that's why. <laughs> it's okay, try, try again. Yep, okay. <laughs>
It's Alex's laptop? Yes. Oh. <coughs> Must be some sort of fat fingering. <coughs> fat finger, yeah. Thanks. Yes, welcome. That's the secret way of spelling red hat. Oh, you even, you photobombed our picture. That's funny. <laughs> oh, no, you had red. No, I have this lovely issue Oh. Photobomb. <laughs> it was good. I like that.
Okay, I tweeted it. You could check. You could check. I tweeted it. It's a good photo bomb. These are, yeah, I started 75. This means that it's being used by someone. Like this one is not. This one is, yep. and disconnection. <clears throat> hmm. Yeah, it's the hotel, it's this Wi-Fi or dependent on it. We're just de dependent on the internet here. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah, comprehensive, right? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you, you, did you like the fact that it was comprehensive, or what did you like? Just the, some things you didn't know? Prepared. Oh, I see. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yep. 6 p.m. is when I automatically shut it down. Yep. Be it's just because, like, um, it's cloud hosted, so I have to pay every hour, right? So. But you don't even have to be here. No problem. 
What? What infrastructure? It's um, it's actually behind the scenes. It's cloud hosted, so it's uh, you know this environment changes from Amazon or Azure. It depends when I provision it. They this in this environment that I have it in, it, it it changes depending on where the workload is less. But it's all cloud hosted. That's why you need internet. Yeah. But you don't have to be here. Right? You just need internet. Yeah. If you really want it, I can, I can. But I mean, that's only if you got, if you will really use it. Because otherwise, like we're, you know. Uh, but I will if you want. I would like to really use it. I would like to recreate the environment. Okay. Okay. Um, I can't leave it on indefinitely, but I, I can if you want it for like an extra. I don't know. Like, what time were you thinking? Oh, no, I can't do that. <laughs> like, okay. Because we pay hourly for this, so. Like, I mean, for the GitHub? Oh, no, no. GitHub I mean, is I'm public. Yeah, I'm of course. Yeah. GitHub is GitHub public. public. I'm talking process. about the lab environment itself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That it, it's going to shut off at 6. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yep. Right. The GitHub is always there. Yeah. yeah it's yep. Tuesday. Tuesday from Prague at like 2 p.m. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll come in first thing. Oh, wow, good me, good. So like, I don't know how to, um, the so I put it in here, the, um, into the Sorel security Okay, I put this. I don't know what time, and I don't know who I should invite. That's my problem. And I asked Peter, but I think he's busy. No, he's sick. Ah, oh, he's sick. So I don't know. Okay, so the border is where security code and for some other what does it mean? For security, something like this, this, this workshop. So, so here, see. To discuss or should we? Oh shit. We want to showcase that summit, so the lab, and discuss the real security deck update. Okay. So what I mean by that is, I have a, I have a slide deck that are as uh, that 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 accomp accompanies this. Sorry, what? Okay. So like I have a slide deck. For all security technologies. Yeah. Okay. But uh, it's kind of like some some talk or. Yeah, I have a talk version of this. So I was just trying to get some feedback. But the more important thing is the lab right now. That's more short term. <coughs> no, but what I do is like, oh, I know. I can show you from here. So like our, our, our um, sales team and our partners, they can access security content from this pro page, OK? So this is the page I created. And this is for all of our products. So, for example, I have one for RHEL security technologies. Okay, and um, 
think I have this one that I created. And then I also have, oh, here it is. But I want to update this. Mm -hmm. Like, I, and I created this diagram. So I, this is like, it goes through all the basic, like, a, like in slides, I go through all of these things at a high level, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, goes through it at a high level, mm -hmm. and then I also. But I want to update this, huh? What's in the sign of spot? It's so it's very very basic. Mm -hmm. See, it's very basic. Mm -hmm. But I need I want to update it, and I want to. I I created this diagram recently. Um, it's part of the overall security deck. Show, show me the invitation list. Okay, where did my calendar go again? Oh, it's so hot in here. Mm -hmm. <sighs> okay, but I gotta find where the... Do you remember where I put it? It's okay. It's okay. See? Oh, let me just show you this the real one. This is the all like secure entire Red Hat portfolio. <coughs> this is the one I'm creating mm -hmm. right now. But um, <coughs> for example, for the real one, mm -hmm. see, I try to do this defense in depth picture. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Here's that uh, in, instead of these box like you saw earlier, like this is my next my next idea okay for policies and awareness you can use this for physical security this perimeter security internal network host security <coughs> application right I see maybe application should also be in host I don't know mm -hmm. but it could also be application mm -hmm. data right to I was just kind of trying to get some feedback on things like this. That's the okay. point, show okay? Me, show me the invitation data or, or your Okay, so now you know the point of what I'm trying to do in the meeting, okay? <laughs> I don't know who else to say. Linux uh, product owner, yes. Um, you you add it. I'm going to talk to the guy who just walked in. <coughs> Hi. Uh, let me. Um, I think you just walked in. So basically, you. Oh, you already got it. You understand? Okay. 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 Thank you. Mm -hmm. He's the one from um, yesterday. Yeah, the one right next. I said, "Who are you?" Yeah. yeah. 
He's also a sea Linux. What other product? Um, do you think that if we say rail security, that's too much probably? It's too much. Too much, right? Too much. This one? That's everybody, right? It that's not everybody. good. Yeah. I don't know who else. <coughs> like, like who's the uh, groups? Who are the team leads? Who are the team leads around security? Who are the team leads? Nikos, who else? No, Nikos is manager. Okay. Hmm? But if he's there, I don't know if we also need Simo. Do you? You guys that have this Mojo page with all the um, real security. Know, I mean, everybody, all the product owners are there. People who are selling it, open ask, uh, special projects. So everybody has this Okay, so add them. I don't know who they are other than Marek. Okay, so then Marek Heichman is another one. He's here. <laughs> oh, he's already there, okay. Then me, already there. Make sure. Let me make sure on the on this mojo page to find it. Martin, okay, so this one is Mark, okay, Marek, okay, so let's see. Danyek, okay, you mean him. No, the, who's this? No, I know this, but I mean, um, who should be there? Oh, you and Zenek, okay. This one, Daniel's already there. Paul Moore is, this is now, um, should he be there? We got everyone. What about the subsystem team? What about these guys? I should add them too. Uh, let me ask. Well, do I need him too? I don't think so. I don't know, but I don't think so. But I, I think you don't need these guys. I don't need them. I don't think so. Okay. But he wanted me to add him. Huh? Last time he sent an email, he said he wanted to collaborate. So I'll okay. add him. Mark's leaving, so let's see. I don't. Probably not him right now. Okay. What room? What room should I do? Sorry. Which room? Okay, so 14. And which room should I do? It's some so in, in the ground. You're, ground not, you're asking for the room. Mm-hmm. So four zero. Oh, wow, but this for ten people. Mm -hmm. That's that's more. And but no, no free. So we will have extra chairs. Okay. And also, and also, for example, you see. Oh, there's we didn't get. Four, no two, and. Mm. and okay, 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 okay. <coughs> so I believe of uh, Peter one at ten. Okay, Dimitri okay, five, okay. So. The Dimitri sometimes does. We'll see. He's he's, he's busy. <coughs> Oh, 
Oh no, you didn't put the room there. Yeah, it's good. It didn't fill it. It's already here. Oh, okay. Yeah, let me make sure. Can hold on. Let me put it in here. Okay. Let me copy here. This is in TPC. People will know. They will understand. No, no, you don't need to write it. Oh, okay. Because it's good for. Oh, okay. Oh, the time. What time do you think I should do? I don't know. Like they, I think Nikos has a has a team meeting or something, right? Let's see. What is this crypto meeting? I don't know. It's busy. What do you think is better? Should I do it um, later in the afternoon? Mm -hmm. This looks okay. Yes. Okay. Late, okay. So three to five is okay? Yes. Okay, all right, then I'll send. Okay. You gonna go? You want me to go too, or are you gonna go? Yeah. Okay. Right here.
Is it an internet problem? No, there is uh, on one of the uh, Xlinux Linux uh, virtual machines there. There is an uh, internal error for for HTTP, but uh, but for another, yeah, yeah, maybe. And then worst case, you could, if, if it's acting funny. Oh, OK. I was just going to say you could get another good, because I have plenty, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, you, we have a lot the directions. You can, re, you know, recreate it. But yeah, the lab environment. Yeah, I'm shutting it down at six. Yeah, but if you want, if you really wanted to, let me uh, leave it on. I I can, but not for like forever, right? Like an hour, maybe extra three hours, whatever. Yeah. Wait. Mm -hmm. There's no way I could fit through there. Mm -hmm. 
Hmm. Oh, it tells you to change the password. So I have had to change on local. To IDM1. Okay, I'll keep a note of that. Thank you.
this is all the slide I have. It's just the lab doc. Did I say that in the lab doc? Oh, I don't remember off the top of my head. Oh, you haven't. I don't know off the top of my head. Let me find out.
so hot in here. Unbearable, huh? But the, there's like a, a hole there, so the birds might fly in, I think. I think it's, there's a chance that the birds will fly in because there's a hole there. Are you hot? <laughs> Are you guys hot? This may be the first time then. Is it better for you guys with this open? So, huh? So far it's okay, yeah. I took it off because it was too hot. Okay, so if the bird flies in, then it's not my fault. I think it's too cold for the birds. But that's why they would come inside, because it's cold outside. It has been open in your previous session. And no bird came in? Not that it was reported in the organization. Did you ask? Uh, is it this one who asked the question about the lab environment? Oh, okay. So it's, um, uh, I can't leave it on indefinitely, but I can leave it on. How, how long do you want to? It no. turns off automatically at 6. No, no, it's okay. Oh. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. This, the lab dog, of course, doesn't. It's on GitHub, so anytime, yeah. Yep. Oh, that, so that, that course is, um, the, the, you're talking about the one on, um, that, the, that for Red Hat training, right? Yeah, yeah. So this is not a Red Hat training course. This was actually delivered by us at Summit. Like it was um, a Red Hat Summit, and Red Hat Summit is not Red Hat training courses. Yeah, yeah. I know, yeah. Yeah. I know about the one. You mean the new one, right? Yeah. The new one? The new one, yeah, yeah. The, they came out like the Linux and the cloud, that one. The, yeah. yeah, it's uh, what they did is they took some of the content here. So you may see they took some of this and then they added to it. Yeah, but that one is like we sell that class. This is this is what this is mainly for like events like this or like um, it was delivered at some Red Hat Summit, things like that. Yeah, cool. mm. you might see some similarities because they took some of this content to build that class. Yeah. I will try. Mm-hmm. Were you hot? Mm -hmm. He was hot, yeah. I'm just scared that the birds might come in, but it, I, maybe they're not outside, I don't know. Huh? Look, so they'll, sh they'll shit everywhere. <laughs> If 
the sparrows come in, I'll take your picture with them, okay? Excuse me? And then you can put it on your Twitter.
was looking for the class. I think it's something to do with object class. I haven't played around with that one, but I'm looking in the doc. Which, what doesn't work? What specifically? Are you sure that you, um, You left off at 8.5 or 8.4? Uh, Where did you finish? I finished the 8.4. And you're at right now trying I'm to do 8.5. Eight eight but it doesn't work. Yeah, okay, let me look. Login what? Fail? Uh, it says user one, uh, onto ID user three. You can't do this part. Yeah. Okay, let me try. Huh? And then it worked? Okay, okay. Yeah, because I, I didn't think you had to do anything special from what I'm looking at, yeah. How long? Until tomorrow morning. You probably you will work on it. I, yeah, people I always say it, and then they're like, "Ah, I'm just gonna go to the pub. I don't want to do it." No, I'm actually I'm going back to my hometown today. I'm going back, so ah. uh, it will take I don't know four hours to do it to get back. I will refer myself, and I would like to continue. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, so tell me what your go it is. The code. What's your code? Uh, so, if what time do you want it till? Noon. 
today? No, no, no. Tomorrow. Tomorrow, okay. Yeah. It will be cool. Okay. Just tell me what your code is. Yeah, yeah. It's D15C. 15C? D or B? D. D15C. Okay. Let me add. Okay. Okay, I'll turn it off at noon tomorrow. Okay. Hi. It was interesting. Um, was it helpful? Yes. Mm -hmm. I made a small pull request for the eight. Oh, okay. Awesome. You thank you. Someone no, I, 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 I have it. Yeah, I'm Great. gonna get it. All right. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, I'm. I'll, I'm gonna. I don't want to do the math to figure out. Um, <laughs> Which time is math? It's like okay. I don't want to do the math. Okay. I'm just gonna keep it on for one day. Okay. Wonderful. Okay. So tomorrow, one thirty, it's gonna turn off. Okay. Yeah. All right. This is yours, right? Yeah. Okay. Right. All right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Nice. Nice meeting you. Thank you. Get up. Yeah, I'm not gonna. That's public. That's public. The lab will turn off at six. The environment will. Yeah. Uh, the reason it's like this is because um, uh, it's it's we don't we don't have physical machines at Summit. This was delivered at Summit last year, so there's there's laptops, but the Vagrant is like if you want to have it all invite. There's not no way like um, it's not repeat. It's not as repeatable, right? Because because with this way how how we have it set up, um, we don't even need to provide laptops, right? Repeat, yeah, exactly. Because if you want to repeat it, because if you want to repeat it, you're right. You're, you're saying if we had vagrant VMs, and you can just, you can just, yeah, yeah. Um, 
yeah, it's, it's a matter of time, right? It's a matter of uh, like, we will create the environment here. This environment doesn't let us export into that format easily. So that's why it's right. not, yeah. So, so the machines have been customized a lot for, for the labs, or just more into the number of installations? Like the, the things you see there, like um, these steps have been done for you. You saw that in the directions. That's pretty much what we did to it. Otherwise, it's RAL 7.5 VMs. Mm-hmm. And for some of them, like the SE Linux lab, I put that the scripts that he wrote um, in in a directory. I don't know if you yeah, saw yeah. that in the exercise. Yep. In actually, it's on GitHub. It's already on. Yeah. Link. It's a Sorry. link on GitHub, yes. Yeah. Summit, um, in, I, I'm thinking of making, like, you know, this is from Summit 2018. For 20, 2019, I'm thinking of designing a whole new one. But I don't, I don't know, I'm not artist either. I have to think about it. Maybe I'll put the fishing krizitska in there. Okay. I don't know. I don't know what to make. I think if I found painting for the summit. Hmm? I'll just give it to you. So I'll ask Peter, I guess, tomorrow. Is he going to be in the office? Maybe, maybe not. About who from his team is able to go to summit? Because I'm pretty sure that it's going to, that it's like, I'm like 99% sure that it's going to get accepted. I'm like very positive. But, but I mean, I could be wrong, but I mean, I'm pretty sure based on this, the mm. conversations I heard at Raleigh two weeks ago. I don't make the final decision though, the REL team does. Not like, not Mark Thacker, but there's the, the REL team, yeah. Remember, it doesn't matter because it, I turn it off at six. You can do this in the hallway. Oh, I see. Yes. Actually, 10 minutes, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 12 minutes. Thank <laughs> you. Oh, I see. When do we have to leave the room? Yeah. of like other cool swag because we have a budget for our summit that we can use to make stuff me so like I'm trying to think like what what else should I make like t-shirt last time I did this sticker mm -hmm. I don't know how I gotta think about it okay, come here. Thank you. oh thank you thank you He was asking me about this, um, the, about IDM. Like, I, I don't remember off the top of my head what this class field is. It's about uh, So, like, do you, I don't know if you know, um, I don't remember off the top of my head, like, um, the <coughs> ad user, like, there's the, um, Yeah, 
basically like um, I created all of these um, mm -hmm. screenshots. It took me forever. It's the basic. No, I didn't. I did all this. Okay. Yeah. Basically, I redid all the entire documentation because I made, made, needed to make it look consistent. Oh, here it is. This? Yeah. I don't know what that, I don't know off the top of my head what that is. I've never used the class. Do you know off the top of your head? No. I couldn't find it. I've never used it. I've never used it either. No, I left it blank. Yeah, usually we leave it blank, so I don't here, know off the top of my head. See if you can find it. 7.5. Seven, five. We're all 7.5. It's going to be updated to RHEL 8 for Summit 2019. And also different exercises for RHEL 8, yeah. I don't know that it's it's that it's actually um, I don't know I don't think we can discuss all those kinds of details okay. yeah because hasn't GA yet so it's in beta yeah all right I can't commit to that because I'm not in the Rel8 um, product management or product like engineering team. Like they, they make the final decisions on that. Excuse me, yeah. we have the answer to that. Yeah, so those are uh, LDAP classes, so it's whatever your object class. It will be automatically filled in whenever you create a user. The only reason you would ever put something in there is if you wanted to put something that the user isn't automatically inserted into. For instance, when you create an object, it's automatically inserted into whatever class is where you did the object creation. Like INET org, like organizational person, like everything is in top, right? Uh -huh. all that, that's what it is. So the only reason you would ever put anything in that box is if you put something, you wanted to put the new user into a class, it's not in its existing hierarchy. Uh-huh, 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 okay. So it's basically that class. Yeah, yeah. It's necessary. Yep. It's, it's, it's an edge case thing. Yeah. So we'll get kicked out in five minutes, but like, like I said, you can, anywhere you have internet, you can finish it. It shuts off at six.
So, let's, um, see. let's see you tomorrow, right? In the office? All day, yeah. I leave Tuesday. Okay. Do you know where this is? Is this in the office? Yes. What is this Pochico? I know, but what is this Porica Nova? What is this? Yeah, this is the address. That's the street, name of the street. At, in the in Brno office? Yes. yes. Oh. So I have to go to Brno office if I want to go to this? That sucks. But it's weird, I believe he made some mistake there. He's there. Maybe not. You have a meeting room. What are you doing? Doing that up? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I thought he put an address here. I thought it was here. But it is in Brno. Because I, I got some you notes. Know, Yeah, I hope it was useful. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some something. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, hopefully you do, yeah. Thank you, thank you. So you get this. Which one? Yeah, I think that's the part, but I think I took a note of it. I understand here because I'm volunteer. Yeah? That's it. So enjoy. Ciao. But your opponent is there, right? Huh? Your opponent is there, right? I was, because like, they can't do the lab without the lab environment, so I, w I wasn't sure what should I... I think it's you know, it's, it's going to cause confusion. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, there still will be there still will be a video. So oh, yeah. the, okay. and they will be able to see, but it won't work, right? I mean, they'll have to work only for a particular day, right? Because I already, I'm shutting it off. So yeah. But, but the GitHub will be there. The, right. In the video, they can see the GitHub and they can see at least the lines off, yeah. right? Well, but they okay. won't be able to work because it's like open shift. <coughs> yeah. it's, it, no, it's inside uh, Amazon yeah. Azure environment. Which so. you launch specifically for workshops only. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. But it, the, my email address is there on that first slide, so they could technically email yeah, me. Actually yeah, actually wanted to participate. I participated in the workshop, but I've got lots of discussions. Oh, no problem. And, uh, no problem. I thought it's quite interesting. Right? Yeah, no problem. Okay. Just a quick question. Do you guys know anything about Fedora budgets for this year's uh, Fedora budget? Fedora budget? Budgets. Uh, there, there is a the Fedora booth over in E has the, the QR code and the URL for it. I think I, I, know, I can write it down. Okay. I'll, I'll just go to it.
should use it somehow in the first place. Are you going to speak? So no, they say, or one by one? Attach your laptop with HDMI. You need to put like a press notebook and so it will turn off. And uh, all the L, L time it should be a pocket touch. So the slide is shown, otherwise, it will show on the middle screen. It will go to sleep. So, yeah. okay. Matthew might have a couple of Is it okay to sit in the first row or should yeah. we release the first row to the panel and sit in the second row? We wait till Matthew gets here. I will just take some space. So Matthew has to answer all the questions. Thank you. Are you ready? Can we go here? I think they're trying to talk. That's the price he pays for bringing the big boss. One of my friends. He has, he has a he has been approaching the task to enable S E Linux engineer is here. Which one? The guy that was here that was the short um uh, list gone. Okay. 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 They're waiting for Which is not to ask how how to actually approach it. Yeah, are you having some SE Linux problems? Because I point you in the right direction. I know, I know, I know you know. But he's trying to attend the session too. Though. Oh. So one of them is always like on mute. This is, I mean, you, you can't mute it. So like this is unmute. Yeah, yeah. This. Wait. So. Uh, wait. It works. Yeah, okay. Both of them are working now. Okay. Yeah, so um, both of them are now working, so you can use okay. But there is no audio in the room. It's only for recording the mics. Okay. Okay. So when I heard somebody will ask you a question, uh, please remember to repeat it on the mic. So you don't need to unmute it or unmute it again, just leave it uh, unmute for the whole session and then we will manage the audio. I don't know. Uh, I'll probably bring some water to you because I don't see what we have here. <laughs> Which is weird, isn't it? 
There he is. Bex who? Hello. Yeah. We, thought you were, we thought you were ditching us. Yeah. Uh, no, I just got hijacked on the way over here. And they have um, two, mic two lock mics for us to pass around. <laughs> They're only for recording, not for the room. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Do you want to keep one of the mics on you and we'll pass around the other, or do you want to pass them both around? Uh, I can keep one on me, or I don't know. I don't know. I don't really know if we have plan for this. I was so. just going to, yeah, yeah. I'm going to show some charts, then we're going to talk. Okay. That's the plan. I thought it was because we were Australian. Naturally more So, you uh, well, there are two microphones. Uh, if somebody asks something, I will please ask you to repeat it on the microphone so it will be recorded. Um, uh, when there will be ten minutes left, I will be showing the ten minutes, and then the five minutes, and then out of time, which means yes. Okay. If uh, you need anything, just let me know. More water, whatever. Something else not or if it's too hot, we can try to open the window. Thank you. Additionally, if you could uh, copy the slides on the USB so we can keep it if you don't mind. Um, we do it, we do it afterward. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That would be okay as well. No problem. The projector should work, but uh, we need to change probably there to uh, the other one. Yeah. If not, the backup plan would be to copy the slides to the USB. How do I drag this window? That's all I want to do. Yeah. <coughs> you have the mirror anyway here, so you can. Uh, I haven't seen it. Okay. Maybe there's not. Okay, I've got keyboard. Okay, yeah. yeah. Just some more stuff. Keep this one down on this end. The time starts. What's that? It's the. There's a reason. <laughs> Mike is live. Check, check, check. Are we starting now? Go for it. Okay. We, we are starting now. Welcome, everybody. This is the Fedora Council BOF, um, birds of a feather, people who care about things. Um, I am Matthew Miller. I am the Fedora project leader. We have other Fedora Council members up here who I will let introduce themselves in a little bit. Uh, first, I'm going to show you some charts because that's what I like to do. And then mostly we are going to, well, I'll show some charts. We'll introduce 
ourselves and say who we are and what we do, and then we will do questions, and that's basically the session here. Um, so I, I didn't have a keynote in which to present charts, so I'm just going to present them raw here without a lot of analysis or talking. Um, the first thing to show is the dinosaur slide, which I show because Smooge has asked me to. Uh, the charts I'm showing are based on some observations of IP addresses and not very much. Uh, we don't have any deep tracking and don't want any deep tracking. So we're kind of, um, it's like we have gone into the jungle and are looking for dinosaurs through binoculars and sometimes there's, you know, um, disasters occur and the data is rough. So uh, that's the caveat. Uh, so here um, is, this is the chart, basically IP addresses um, seen, per, unique IP addresses seen per day for each Fedora release for all time. Um, normally I uh, kind of sm uh, gloss over this chart because it is a little bit hard to read because of all the different things here. But this one is super interesting because here's Fedora 29 and wow, that's a gigantic jump. Um, so it, this is a very popular release, at least by our metrics here. Um, honestly, I can't explain why. It's a great release. We've been doing a good job and everything is awesome. Um, but I don't know that it's 40% more awesome than the previous release. Maybe it is. You have a new program manager. Right, we do have a new program manager. Um, this also could be a network topography change because we count unique IP addresses. So if something's behind NAT at a, at a um, like at a big institution and they're using IPv4, um, all of those will show as one IP address. So maybe there's 20,000 machines at a large company that are using IPv4 and they're only then shows up as, you know, a dozen IP addresses because they're all, you know, filtered through that funnel. If that company switched to IPv6 and then all of those machines are now showing up with unique IP addresses, maybe suddenly they're all being counted differently. So maybe it's something like that. I like to think that there's probably some increase in popularity here as well. Um, but again, there's a gigantic dinosaur there. We'll see what happens. Um, if we look at this, this is that, that last one was a seven day moving average. This is just kind of a zoomed in view of the last um, of the per day versions. So you can see these go up and down um, with uh, fewer check-ins on the weekends and more check-ins on the weekdays. That's pretty much the typical pattern there. But again, it's pretty high. Uh, numbers there, and it, you know, it, it doesn't. There's not like some like weird spike or something. That's basically, you know, kind of the. It's the normal kind of growth we see in a release, just steeper. So I don't know. Maybe we just are very successful, and everybody should be proud of themselves. Uh, uh, this is the same thing in a stacked graph, and we can see again, like uh, the overall numbers here. You know, a few years ago we were looking at. at uh, the total number of deployed systems checked in as somewhere around 200,000. That doesn't mean there's 200,000 machines out there. Again, the IP address thing, and then not every machine checks in every day, as you can see with the up and down graph. So I don't know. I think this probably represents 2 million Fedora machines out there in the wild somewhere, which is, which is pretty good. Um, but again, a, a lot of growth there, and it's absolute growth. It's not just that the older releases are being cannibalized to the newer release. Um, but we also see that yeah, a lot of people are upgrading to the newest releases. Like there aren't people, the, the uh, people running Fedora, 20, uh, Fedora 8 here, this light blue thing, there's still a sizable number of them there, but it's, it's finally decreasing to so the absolute percentage of it is um, reasonable. There's the NRKD3 users, I guess. Yeah, KD3 users, yeah. Um, uh, Right, and yeah, well, we, we see the same thing with um, Fedora 15 doesn't have a separate thing where uh, people didn't want to go to GNOME 3. Uh, that's, that was very, if that's back here in this graph here where um, this, this release right here had system D and GNOME 3 in it. So, I mean, there's, again, a lot, lot of possibilities, but I think that was just a lot of change all at once right there, and that took a little while to recover from. Um, so we try want to we want to manage change carefully in the future when you have big changes like that. Um, this is the same thing, but for Apple. Um, so this is uh, five, six, and seven. Uh, this is again a seven-day moving average. I think there's s s several interesting things here. Um, 
we have the you know, RHEL 8 beta out now, and just in time for that, Apple 7 has finally become more popular than 6. So uh, you can see that the enterprise Linux audience is very conservative, which I think should surprise nobody. Um, but there's some really fun things also here. Um, this, when uh, RHEL 5 went EOL, uh, like that day, a lot of machines dropped off the network, um, but then uh, some of these continue. And I think that this might reflect a config difference between CentOS and Enterprise Linux, um, that where some of them kept checking into the mirrors even though the, even though the release was EOL and some of them didn't, but I'm actually not quite sure on that. But anyways, that drop. And then this spike right here is super fun. And again, this is a seven day moving average, so actually this number goes up way like off the charts here on this one day. A whole bunch of people decided, wow, I should apply security updates today. <laughs> um, and it's, it's a, yeah, it's uh, kind of amazing. When I looked at that, that I was like, what happened? Is there, oh yeah, I know what happened that day. So I think that that's pretty awesome. Um, this is the same thing stacked here. You can kind of, again, see there's a lot of growth. Oh, I, uh, this was going to be the one with Fedora and Apple both on them, but I guess I duplicated slides. Um, yeah. Uh, so I'll just have to explain. The Fedora numbers we can see are going up pretty well, and these Apple numbers are also going up. Um, the Apple ones are an order of magnitude over Fedora release, which um, means that people who are working on Apple have a huge amount of impact in terms of the, the actual like places their software is deployed. That doesn't mean that the Fedora release doesn't have a lot of impact as well, because that Apple release and the you know, Enterprise Linux stuff that it's used wouldn't be possible without the faster moving innovative side. So we kind of expect on the innovation curve for there to be a smaller number of users on the faster moving things. So that's uh, doesn't mean the impact. If you're, if you're only interested in working on the Fedora leading edge stuff, it doesn't mean it's not important. Uh, and I don't want to don't want to downplay that part. But it's also important to realize how much impact we have with Apple as well. Although we wouldn't turn down being double Apple. Right, yeah, right, yeah, exactly. It would be nice to have all those numbers up really high. Uh, okay, this switches to my other chart here, a totally different thing where I, instead of um, dinosaurs having to do with um, IP addresses, these are things that we see in FedMessage. FedMessage is a Fedora message bus um, where a lot of things where people make wiki page edits or check-ins to get or um, QA uh, feedback all get sent over the message bus with your username attached. So I counted the unique usernames that show up. Um, over the course of a year, this ends up to being about 4,000 different people who are seen, somewhere between two and 4,000, depending on how you draw some lines. Um, and I've tried to filter out bots and automated things from there. Uh, so mostly th these are humans. Um, the blue lines are the ones that basically are mostly drive-through contributions. So every the, the graph here is for each week. So um, basically, some somewhere like 300, 350 people, every unique at names are seen doing some activity in Fedora every week. Um, of those, the solid line ones here, these are people whose names keep showing up for basically um, at least uh, one quarter of the last year. They've shown up for that, that amount of the year. So these, these are basically the people who are solid, um, always around contributors. And then the colors show how long that person was first seen. So the red ones have seen, been seen for, at that point, more than two years. And then the green are new users. And then the yellow is in between there. Um, so this chart isn't great. I mean, it shows that we've got a nice consistent um, core base of contributors that, and we're not like dropping things off. I think there's kind of a slight downward trend over the last three years here, which I think is concerning. Um, it's hard to really draw a line through the top, but it kind of feels like there's a peak every year and then it drops off. I don't know why that would be. Like people get excited in January and then their New Year's resolutions don't pan out or. Uh, the gym gets in the way. Yeah, right, yeah, some, something like that. Um, but yeah, I think that. What's that? Oh yeah, yeah, right. Um, yeah, the, the 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 drop down every year that is Christmas, um, which I also find a fascinating thing. It's like nice to see the real world in your data. Um, so you know, Red Hat has a shutdown, and a lot of people you know just aren't around doing things. Um, but you can also see that during that shutdown, oh, there's still like 
people show up and do work. So it's not like it's uh, it's not like we're off <laughs> in those times. Um, but yeah, I, what I really would like to see is that green line get bigger and the yellow line be a little more healthy than it is. I, I don't want the red line to go away. Um, that I, that's maybe unfortunate coloring. It's not like a problem. It's actually great that we have so many people who stick around. Um, more what's that? More yeah, exactly. Um, so uh, I would like to figure out how to do that. And I talked about this last year. Um, and you can see we haven't haven't changed that picture very much in the year here. Um, so hopefully we can do better this year. Um, one of the things we've talked about is uh, kind of um, in the Fedora Mindshare initiative, which is kind of our outreach to new users and outreach to the community sort of side of Fedora. Uh, we want to have a lot more small events. And we've actually asked for it to be um, two $150 events every week by that group. So that's kind of the challenge we put out to that group. We've uh, put funding in place for that. Uh, yes, Brian. I just had a question about Yeah, uh, the question is, do we... Right, and yeah, so one of the things that questions is, is do we see this trend other places, or maybe is it just a downturn in the things that we're measuring? Um, yeah, and actually, one of the things that should be noted here is, one of the things that feeds into this is wiki page edits, and we've done two things to the wiki. First of all, you have to be in another Fedora group in order to edit the wiki because we're having a huge spam problem. So that makes the bar for wiki editing higher. And we've also tried to push things to using docs.fedoraproject.org instead for a lot of things that are documentation. And those things aren't measured here because of um, it's hard to count those in PAGR properly. Randy? Have you considered letting the spam put on the wiki so the scrappers up again? Yeah. <laughs> have I, question was, have we considered allowing the spammers to make the graph go up again? Um, well, one thing yeah. to Brian's point that I think would be interesting to compare to is um, uh, Fedora Magazine, right? Which I right. think, as I recall, is still on a pretty good upward tick, right? And yeah. you know, as brilliant as I'm sure it is, I bet it's got a limited user base or you know, reader base um, you know, it's not going to be, you know, general tech readers all that much, right? It's going to be at least Linux people, if not even specifically for Yeah, people. right. So, um, and also Brian keeps track of um, social media metrics for us, and we know that the Fedora Twitter account keeps getting more and more followers and is... Uh, of, of all the upstream projects that I track in OSAS, it's got this, this growth curve. Yeah, so of all the... And of all the projects that Brian tracks, I'm repeating for the recording, uh, all the projects that Brian tracks, uh, the upstream projects that OSAS, uh, Red Hat's open source and standards group tracks, Fedora has the steepest growth curve for both Facebook and Twitter followers. So we're definitely seeing growth there that fits more with the um, IP address stats as well. Um, so yeah, I think yeah, there's definitely some other things we could do here. So I don't want to get too freaked out about this, but I still think that that growth should be contributing to more green and yellow in this number. So I'm not, I'm not super freaked out about the blue line going down, but um, I think we should be seeing the other things go up if things are working. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, Tomasha asks, uh, if we get package automated, um, will this graph collapse even more? Yes, I think it should. Um, but I'll need to find another way to find measure people's involvement. Because we're not trying to get rid of people with that. We're trying to put the people into doing more interesting and useful things. So I think that'll collapse my graph, but won't um, won't collapse users. I just want to comment. I mean, like, I think this is a very, very important piece of data. And like, I really, really think we need to do a better job of capturing it if we're not sure how right it is. Because, it, you know, this is our bread and butter right here, right? This is, this is us showing revenue growth, right? Like, you know, this is really, really important. Uh, yeah. And I really think we need to stop having these presentations without this being good data. You know, or knowing, or having a pattern for getting it. Yeah, fair. And, you know, I recognize it's a lot of work. I'm just saying, so Bax has definitely volunteered. Um, uh, right. right. No, and just you know, like I it, personally, for me, this is something 
you know, we should find Fedora budget for and go hire an intern. Like we, we need to do this better. If we don't have the time to do it as, you know, the regular contributors to the project, then we should go pay somebody to do it, you know? Yeah, one of the challenges is um, a lot of this stuff needs to be, to, in order to measure it easily this way, it needs to be linked to your Fedora FAST account. And a lot of the activities, especially as we expand into like other ways of working, you know, Telegram you know, is very popular, like that's not your FAST account. That's not stuff that we can easily track in this way. Um, so I need to figure out ways of doing that. So yeah, an intern who's interested in this, that'd be awesome. Uh, actually, I, I actually could probably generate this as a research project for BU. Okay, yeah. sold. Uh, Langdon's going to generate this as a research project for BU. Yeah. yeah I've got a question about Rohai because oh. uh, you have some data about Rohai because maybe they might also show us uh, something like if we are doing, for example, better job testing, gating, whatever. Well, become more yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it's interesting. <laughs> um, it's actually. Um, yeah, right. This is rawhide back in uh, ten years ago. A higher portion of people were running rawhide I mean, as a percentage, a gigantically huger portion. Uh, but also, the absolute number was higher back then. Um, so, yeah. So, I said, I this, uh, but it also might be right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it and may, it may also, I mean, it may be reflective of people wanting, you know, like they're doing their work differently, right, to yeah. Dan's point. Um, you know, I'm not sure, do we want the rawhide number to go up, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, so, I don't know, or do we just make it so that there's a, a perpetual beta, you know, that's kind of like rawhide, but there's not really any rawhide anymore, yeah. if it's all gated. To, to Adam's point, um, the, a lot of people are using the branched version, the beta versions, before we get to Rawhide. And that's actually, you can see that on the graph here. That's actually fairly popular. That's yeah, this that's here. Beta, right? Yeah, I, right. This is, yep. Yeah. Yep, exactly. Um, so, yeah, that's uh, pretty good, too. But um, should we let some other people talk here? Let's let people introduce themselves and um, say what you do on the council. I'm looking at Dennis because you're standing on this side here. <laughs> yeah, except for where did I put the mic? It's in my pocket. Uh, trouble's going to happen. Right. Yeah. Stop talking. Otherwise, all we get on the recording is you saying, oh, let me take off the mic. Then. <laughs> I'm Brian Exelbeard. I'm the Fedora Community Action and Impact Coordinator, um, and I work around Mindshare and other community-focused events or components of the project. I'm Langdon White. I've been here a couple of times. Uh, I'm the Modularity Objective Lead. Hi, I'm Till Maas, and I'm the uh, one of the two elected representatives from the community. Hi, I'm Dominic Papet, and I'm the CI Objective Lead. Uh, hi, I'm Yona, and I represent the Diversity and Inclusion Team. And I'm Ben Cotton. I'm the Fedora Program Manager. I'm Peter Shabata, and I'm the currently serving engineering representative. And I'm Dennis Gilmore. I am the other elected member of the board, uh, the council. <laughs> right. It used to be the board long ago. <laughs> um, so actually, I have a question for Dominic. We talked about gated or better rawhide. Can you talk about better rawhide for, you know, what are, what are we doing there? Sure. So without having this written up that completely, so we sent around, um, what we really want to do is gate, mm, gate rawhide, right? We want more things to work and uh, be in a place where we can develop uh, new things and try out new things without being blocked by others who are also working on new things. I think that's, as a community, that's what we want to have. So we want to have, if we want to have bleeding edge, we can go to upstream, right? But if we want to have, yeah, let's, let's see what, 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 what is coming next. That should be gated rawhide. Um, so we'll have that and combine that with uh, automated packaging where you can pull things automatically from upstream. Um, Tomas Tomaszek will work on that. And yeah, I think we have some, some good plans on how to 
get some of that started, maybe hopefully by flock. So, what is gated rawhide? What for as a packager? What does gated rawhide mean? What what is the gate, and what do I do have to do to get through it? So, yeah, excellent question. What that gating actually means, right? We have um, seen some things. We've started um, testing packages in Fedora a while back. Um, for various reasons, that was not quite as successful. There was there were usability issues, and the question is how that actually worked out. It was limited to to atomic packages. So what we want is first of all um, a package level gating. That means we when you look at a package, what does that mean? Right? It's not just the code, but if we look at the, at the distribution, the Fedora, we should also define how do I expect that to work in the distribution. So I have I have tests that cover how those packages work. Um, so when I submit something, submit a, a new build, for example, um, we should run those tests. But not only those tests, but also other tests from other packages. So that when I say I have, um, let's say I have the dream that when I pull Rawhide, it can actually boot. It's far-fetched, <laughs> but, you know, it's things like that. Or that I can do certain things like use it for... Uh, yeah, just have some 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 stories where some some basic things like can, I should be able to compile other things or maybe even see a desktop. Um, have, if when I have those stories, those thing, things should be tested, and if I submit something that breaks those things, I should be gated. So, for example, we should we should, we should say that update is not going to go in right now. Um, Imagine a testing system, so I'm not sure about the implementation, right? So that's where we'll want feedback, but imagine a testing system that says, my karma is minus one on this, because your, your, your update will, not, be, will not, not let me boot my Fedora. So you should, you'll be blocked, or the package will be blocked um, from getting in, and you have time to fix the issue without, well, well, before you would get it in, people would send you a lot of emails and saying, thank you for breaking my installation, when will you fix that? So um, it might feel like a slowdown a bit because tests will be run. So you don't, when you submit, submit something else, it's not going to go automatically in. But um, in the end, I think it'll be a more comfortable development place because you don't break other people's workflows. And um, you have the chance that when, you, when we test against Rawhide, when you really try it out, um, things are not as broken and you can try out new features. So that was a lot of talking, so. Yeah, so from a practical experience, say I have an update to sudo, and I try to put it into, yeah, right, I, I, I'm a package maintainer for sudo, so watch out, everybody. Uh, <laughs> Which is currently broken. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So um, let's say suddenly that doesn't let you log in, which, you know, is a fairly, you, you can't, you can no longer get root even though you're in the wheel group. Um, and so we've got some test for that. And I, it worked on my system because I happen to have, a, on my local system where I'm building it, I've got some other local configuration which is non-standard, which happens to let it work. So I didn't notice it, worked fine for me, I build it in Rawhide, what happens next? Okay, so we'll, say, we'll see there's, there's this new build, and um, we have tests then that are attached to your package, for example. Or and they're really good tests. Yeah, just for they're the really good tests. Um, yeah. Or say we have other packages that depend on sudo and say, hey, when sudo changes, run our tests too because Matthew keeps breaking our, our stuff, right? Um, so we'll, we'll run those tests for you. They're, all the tests are in a standardized format. Um, there's their wiki pages and also documentation pages on, on that. Um, and thankfully, we don't have to run those tests on your system because we have this cool thing called CI, right, on, on CentOS CI. So we talked to Brian Stinson about that. We run those tests, and if those tests fail, we'll say, well, that does not get into Rawhide. We're sending out a notification to you and say, you failed these tests. Here, you can look up where those tests are. These are the logs. Here's the person to contact. Let's, let's figure it out. So my package is built, goes through Koji, but then it doesn't get into the Compose, and then I get email about it, or how do I... How do I know that I messed well, things up? Think, oh. Yes, <laughs> I think for I think so for sudo you might get more people, but yeah, no. <laughs> um, yeah. I think there are different ways we can do that right now. Um, I think the, the we have the, the notification system that we can use, but I think the email email will be the default okay. for that.
while yeah, the question is a very good question. We've been talking about this for eight years. What, what's the current status of it? Eight years is an exaggeration. It's really only like six. I thought it was like seven and a half. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so the current status is that we do have tests that are run for packages, but they don't have an effect, right? Because there, there were various usability issues, so gating was disabled for a while in Fedora because people were saying, this breaks our workflows. We can't really use it properly. So we have worked out a new plan, which is not all the details yet ironed out with the Fedora Infra, for example, where we have figured it out. We have an idea of how to do this properly with using tags, um, if you want to know the details, so that essentially your workflow doesn't change except for the fact that there's a slight delay between when you've built something and it goes <coughs> the rest of the way through Bodhi. So we, we, do run the t we do run the test for a subset of packages right now but not all of them, so that will change. <coughs> and um, whereas right now the test results don't, don't, don't have an impact, then moving forward, um, they will prevent packages from going into Rawhide with uh, the asterisk at this point that um, we believe as a human we should have responsibility or as a packager. So if you say, for example, I don't believe in that test result, there's a way to, to waive those things. So it's always... Like, if you're certain, I've tested this. If Matthew says, I don't, I don't believe that test, it, <laughs> everyone, should, everyone should set up their machine like I set up mine. <laughs> Just push it out to everyone, then, yeah. then he can do that. Matt DM gets rootless sudo, a uh, passwordless sudo. Yeah, it's yes. Um, will, sure. this be, will this process be any different for stable branches or other changes? Yeah. Um, so, th so the question yeah. was whether this, was, th this is also going to apply to stable branches. Um, I think it should, but this is scope to rawhide for now. So we believe that this is where the development happens. I think this is where we feel a lot of the pain, also doing the, the process, where, we'll, where we can catch things early and unblock others. So I think the testing system should scale. There's no reason why you can't run those tests on, on all the other updates. But um, let's not try to solve everything at the same time. Adam? Uh, you can come get a mic if you've got a lot to say. <laughs> you don't want that. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to add to what Dominic was saying. There were um, there's two s two sort of angles on this. When we tried turning on gating, we did it for stable releases via Bodhi, and that kind of I showed up a bunch of inadequacies in the process which people have been working on since, and that hasn't been very visible work, but there's been a lot of work done in GreenWave, there's been a lot of work done in ResolvedDB, there's lots of people trying to put bits of the puzzle together to make it less of an exciting experience than it was last time. And the other thing that Dominic was kind of talking, talking about, but it wasn't clear if he didn't know what he was talking about, is this is different in Rawhide because we don't have Bodhi. So the big piece that was missing for doing rawhide package gating is there was no mechanism by which you could say these three package builds have to be tested together, otherwise all the tests for all of them are going to fail. And we kind of had to come up with a plan to do that, and that's what Dominic was talking about, about tags. The idea is the fed package is going to make you side tags, basically. But we had to go through a, f a few different design changes to come up with that idea, and that's what's getting done now. The question was, does this mean that site tag is generation is automatic? And the answer was, it's on request and automatic at the same time from two different people. No and apparently, apparently Mike McGrath is not involved in physically doing this. So uh, let's Anymore. Anymore. we could probably talk about this for another two hours, but let's, let, let's see if we can move on to some other topics. Um, are there other things people want to talk about in the audience, or should I start prompting council members here? Mike McGrath. The youths. What are we doing to attract the youths? Yoni, do you want to take this? Uh, you, the youths, young people. That's what is. Uh, it's a joke from an old movie because. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
so as also Matthew mentioned a bit before, uh, especially Mindshare is working on this. So like for example, release parties, um, especially this time, like it's even easier to organize a release party and to have your budget approved. Uh, so like uh, people that are not only ambassadors, so we are trying also to lower a bit the barrier, not only ambassadors can organize a release party, uh, they can hold a uh, release party, um, a, a small event, let's say, uh, at their country, their city. And in this way, they can go to universities, for example. They can have a talk there. But uh, especially release party, it's not that, uh, it's like especially user friendly for new people. So like just talking about the community, what it is, and also like trying to install on their computers or things like that. So this is one of the approach. And we think that especially the release party is a um, nice way, especially for new contributors to join, but not only. But this is uh, one of the things. And especially lowering the barrier, not only ambassadors, we will have um, also other people that, um, let's say they will be kind of process so they can um, start organizing, but that doesn't mean that you need to be an ambassador officially to do that. You just need to know about the community, how it is, um, how to join, and so on. Yeah, what was the term for that? Does it, we, we made up a advocate. new word. We've been using advocate, yeah. but we're not advocate. titling it out. OK. Yeah. Get out of here with your labels, Matthew. <laughs> 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 so, right. There, there was, the, the reason of, for labels is there was kind of a thing where people felt like being a Fedora ambassador um, should require a certain amount of commitment and involvement with the project to get that title, and to, to get that sort of a badge of the ambassador should be a certain level. But we also wanted people to be able to just like show up and get involved. And previously that you've got to become an ambassador before you can do things meant that people were like, nah, never mind. Um, and that wasn't working so well. What's that? Yeah, <laughs> David says it got a little weird. Okay. Uh, Ben suggests that we should go to Jen Madriaga next. Um, Jen is our events coordinator and has been working very hard on getting things set up for Flock for this next year. Uh, so. No, I'll just I'll just stand here. It's is it muted? Okay. Okay. It, it, come be on video, Jen. Uh, There's, video? There's video. Isn't there video? Yeah. Yeah. I assume this video. So. Uh, so Matthew has asked me to make the official announcement for where Flock is going to be this year. And I think this is the earliest that we have ever made the announcement. Yeah, sometimes <laughs> it's, it's still like January. <laughs> so I would, I'd like a round of applause for that. Um, so uh, we've been working on um, sourcing a location. We're, we're still confirming where the hotel is going to be. Um, but we are going to be having it in Europe again this year. And we're uh, going to be located in Budapest, Hungary hey. this year. Hey. And, and so I hope all of you can come this year. It would be um, great to see all of you there. And I'm sure there's questions about why we're in Europe a second yeah. year. Dates. Yeah. It's Dates. Dates. Okay. So um, August, August no. 8th through 11th? Plus or minus one day. Yeah. Plus <laughs> or minus one day. <laughs> August. <laughs> all the months. <laughs> all of them. Just keep coming, and one of those months will be right. No, so it's going to be in August like it always is, August 8th to 11th, uh, followed closely on the heels of another conference that we'll announce, I think. Did we already announce no, DevConf so US? All right. Yeah. Um, and followed by DevConf US, which I will also be so at. DevConf India is, was, is the week before be Flock. And then, Budapest, and then it will be DevConf US in Boston. So... If you had any plans for August, can't uh, <laughs> To say someone's going to be and doing a lot of traveling. August, you're all invited back to Bruno. There won't be a crowd, right. but you're all invited back. Max is putting everybody up. He's going to yeah. do a massive barbecue. <laughs> Um, so like I said, we're still negotiating with the hotel and we want to just make sure everything's squared away with some of the details there like internet because um, that's important. Um, and hopefully we will be able to um, have that announced in the, in the next um, couple of weeks or so. Uh, but we are going to be doing a launch of registration. And I don't know when we're going to launch to Eventbrite. Um, Bax, do you want to 
give us a within the next 14 days i have to go to fosdem so it depends on how bad it is okay so <laughs> so after fosdem we will have the registration site up and then we are going to also update um the flock to fedora website um so you can now mark your calendars and make travel plans it's definitely going to be in budapest we just can't tell you which hotel it is yet but we should have those details hopefully in the next couple of weeks um so and for those of you from Amazon and Facebook and so on, we will have a sponsor prospectus as well. <laughs> just, just, um. <laughs> yes. So please sponsor. Um, I think that's it. I don't think, does anyone have any questions? I, I'm sure the main question is why it's in Europe again. And maybe someone from the council can talk to that. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Yeah. yeah. It's Mike's fault. Yeah, basically, uh, the reason that we're in Europe again is Mike's fault. Um, no, in all seriousness, we, we, like a lot of other conferences, have to recognize that we exist in a universe where lots of people have lots of other commitments. Um, and so one of the things that we had found out was it was very hard for certain people to get travel funding from a certain company in the years that we were in Europe because it was timed wrong for that company. That and company is Red Hat, just yeah. for the record. Yeah. Uh, so when so. Red Hat Summit is on the West Coast, it's very expensive to go to also Europe that year. That's exactly what I was about to say. And so for the record, when Red Hat Summit is on the West Coast, um, it was hurting some travel budgets, and so it was making it harder to send folks to Europe. So we were asked to change the TikTok, and well, I like Europe, so we stayed in Europe. Um, no, it was actually slightly more democratic than that. But Europe is actually really good for us, and we felt like having a second conference here to reset the TikTok was going to be a good move forward. Uh, and if you're interested in the further conversation, there is a council ticket on this. You can go and look in our PAGR, and there's a closed council ticket that explains all the rationales that we went and, through. And Brian, can you just make it clear for the recording that we will be continuing the TikTok? Yeah, we will be back in, in North America in 2020. Um, and Jen and I hopefully will be able to make an announcement in 2019 this time for where 2020 will be. So our goal is to be able to put up a banner stand at Flock with a city name on it that's even right. So um, I, I'll, I'll promise you a banner stand with a city name. <laughs> Let me put it that way. And apparently a Lord of the Rings costume, but that's a different speech. Every day of Flock, the, the name will Yeah, the name will change. <laughs> oh, nope, nope, too expensive. Any one of our contributors in Alaska has been lobbying for an Alaska flock, so I... I'm down with that. Yeah. <laughs> but the other thing is that uh, regardless of what continent it's on, we really wouldn't want to have the people come face-to-face -face who, um, who make Fedora work and who can, you know, benefit from the connections we make when we have flock and get everybody talking in the same place. And so, uh, like previous years, um, we're trying to decouple the funding from whether you're a speaker or not. We want to make sure that you know, we get key community members to flock wherever it is in the world. Um, we don't have an infinite amount of funding, but that's why we're asking for sponsorships. I mean, that, that's what the money goes to. We want to make sure that everybody um, can participate because it's a really important um, thing for the community. I, I, I would just add, to be very explicit about it, we are not geolocking the funding. So tell your friends that are important contributors who don't happen to live in Europe that they are not geo-blocked out of funding. We look at contributors worldwide. And for those of you with companies that do have travel budgets where speaking is an important part of that travel process, let us know because we can work with you to get you letters that explain what's going on and how we're making our decisions and why you're so valuable to us to try and help you make those business justifications so we can release funding for other contributors. Adam. Well, it's a new question, so are yeah. we Fedora 31? Oh, yeah, so. The question was, are we delaying Fedora 31? And Matthew will begin answering. I'm going to turn that over to our <laughs> program manager who's in terms of schedules. <laughs> Can't get the mic off fast enough. <laughs> uh, so, barring any like complete freakouts about that, we will not be delaying Fedora 31. Uh, the schedule is in draft form; it's not published to the community yet. That will be uh, very soon. But for the time being, we are looking at continuing with the twice a year, uh, you know, late April, early May, and October into November. Hopefully, not uh, release pro cycle. So. I feel nothing. I haven't seen it. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> Put that on the mic. Adam says he feels Adam. nothing. <laughs> Other questions? What about the new logo? Do we have anything to share? Uh, what about the new logo? Uh, okay, I, I don't know if does everybody know that we were working on a uh, refresh for the Fedora logo? Does anybody not know this? <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So um, the Fedora logo, the design team has so. We've had this logo for a while. It's not the not since the beginning of the project, but you know a lot of us are very attached to it. Um, it has a number of challenges. Um, it's kind of weirdly off center. It doesn't work in two colors. We had a big back and forth with the fine people at the awesome people at Font Awesome who wanted to make a black and white version of the logo, which looks hideous, and uh, made the design team people have spasms. Um, so. We asked them to not do that, and but we actually want you know our logo to be available and easy to use, and for it to work on you know places where we need to do screen printing or things like that. So that's a problem. Um, it's kind of weirdly off center, which is problematic. Um, and we have Facebook people here again, right? Like um, the F is easily confused by most people in the world with the Facebook icon logo. And I went and look, looked back. Are we being recorded? We being recorded. I, I'm not a lawyer, You're but I went back and looked recorded. at trademark dates. We were bef we were first with that F, but just by a little bit. And you know, it's been a long time now. And um, I, I, I feel like they may have beat us on brand recognition. So. Uh, <laughs> So uh, we're looking at doing some adjustments to do that. And uh, so Mo Duffy from the Fedora design team, who is really awesome with user experience and also with um, kind of thinking through the way things work in a design sense, uh, has kind of looked at um, and worked with the rest of the design team and uh, with uh, community members to go through you know, some refresh ideas for the logo. She has a really good blog post. Uh, we link to it on, I think, on the Fedora magazine. Um, I, it's on her blog. It's so on the yeah, Twitter. So yeah, yeah. All right. On on the Twitter somewhere. I, I really encourage you to look for that post because it really kind of goes through the background of the logo and why we're changing it and um, some of the the candidate ideas for uh, what a new logo will look like. We don't have a we don't have the finalized new design yet, and we're going to make sure we go through some more iterations of community feedback. Make sure it's a really open process. Um, you the, forgot you forgot the best one, Fedoro. Fedora. Oh yeah, yeah. Another thing is, if you look at the word Fedora from a distance, the a, the, the font that's used, um, the A um, yep. kind of looks like an O. Uh, and the fact, um, when I look at um, searches coming into our websites that are typos, Fedora is one of the high up ones. <laughs> so I feel like um, it, we, there may be some real confusion in the world over that one. Like, what is this Fedora? Uh, Maybe it's a typo, but I think the lo like it really does at small sizes look like that. So we also also the font is not open source in the original design, so we're replacing with an open source font, which um, is uh, seems yeah something we definitely should do. Um, I can try and find that blog post now, but uh, I can do it while yeah. you're talking. Okay. That's not a web. Browser. And then you're going to put it on the screen from your phone, Langdon. How's that? Gonna have He's going to send it to somebody who can then project it. <laughs> <laughs> why don't we keep so talking? Yeah, right why don't we keep talking while that happens? Yes, yeah, somebody else talk about something else. How is the uh, release cycle of Fedora Core OS going to be versus So the question is, what? how is the release cycle of Fedora Core OS going to be different from Fedora? And that's actually a great question because I don't work with the Fedora Core OS stuff. Um, Matthew, do you happen to have that answer while you're trying to no, furiously I, Google? I asked that question in the Fedora Core OS book, and I believe they said it's going to be similar to yeah. two weeks in public. Um, okay. But they're planning to have three streams. Okay. Okay. That's so, my so, understanding as well. So the answer was it's going to be similar to uh, Atomic, but with three streams? <laughs> yeah. So, so every two weeks, three streams. Every two weeks. And what means that for all the PCs? What PC, which is not so hard and RAM? Yes, what does that mean? Because an atomic cannot run on my laptop. So the question is, what does that mean for older hardware that doesn't have RAM that atomic won't run? Um, use something else, I guess. I mean, um, I think we're 
you know, Fedora as you know, our main um, you know, sort of standard distributions still run on fairly low powered hardware. Brian has a better answer, it looks like. I'll try. Oh, sorry. I wanted both microphones, so now I own the entire Fedora Council. Um, so, uh, my understanding, and since Matthew's distracted, he cannot correct me when I'm wrong is that even if we choose to move forward with using a default of desktop that is built on atomic or related technologies, that does not necessarily mean the other builds will go away. They may not be an addition anymore, but if there's an interested community that wants to keep them around, they'll certainly be something that we can continue to build. Um, Fedora has in general always tried to run on a large set of generations of hardware and this is something we're going to have to deal with and think about and I don't think anybody on the council is going to vote out of, you know, in, out of uh, quick, uh, quickly vote, let me say it that way, to say all right we're just going to kill off people who don't have this much RAM and sorry you go find another distribution, um, we like you. And uh, so I, I think we will find a solution there. Um, you have seen some similar th things around certain architectures where we may not have those architectures supported fully in an addition, but there's a group of people who want to bring that about, and we're seeing builds for it and things like that, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. I, would, I would actually say three numbers, but I think I have the wrong three numbers in my head. Are they 386? They are. Was it 386? <laughs> Sweet. So it's 386. Or 686, or 686. I don't know. Uh, 429. Is that a thing? Sorry, I don't do PC architectures. Uh, oh, and we have the blog yeah, post now, so because you're, you're not there. on thing. You should read the whole thing. I'm going to skim through here. Um, but she's Linux girl, girl with no eye. Yeah, like and you, you don't have a like, thing. Like Ryan girl. Um, there's some... Oh, yeah, microphone. Um, this kind of goes <laughs> through the background and the history and you know, shows things that are problematic. And yeah, there's the Facebook. OK, um, through the process here and some of the design things. Oh, and now we're to the comments. So um, there were a couple different things suggested. Um, this candidate number two actually turns out to look very much like an existing logo of somebody else. So we're kind of focusing around this candidate number one. And there's some refinements to this that are being worked on here still. But this is the, the idea. Uh, so it kind of keeps, it keeps the um, three elements of the voice bubble, the infinity, and the F, which actually stands for freedom, not for, for Fedora. Who knew? Um, but yeah, so it kind of keeps those, but um, moves the F away from the Facebook-like F, um, changes the font around a little bit. So it's not like a gigantic, we're throwing everything away, it won't be recognizable, it won't look like the Fedora logo. Um, and I, I think the exact shape is still subject to some tweaking, and there's going to be some more feedback on that. But that's the direction this is going. It kind of looks like an Ouroboros sign. Yeah, it, it eats, eats its own tail. Is, is that bad, Mike? Okay. <laughs> well, your feedback is welcome. Um, one of the other things is that um, this, we're also looking at guidelines that allow it to be used without the bubble in cases where that um, makes more sense, um, where you need something a little more simple, because our current one, again, is a very complicated thing, and it's the actual guidelines require it to be used in a complicated way. I think Langdon's shirt is probably out of spec, right? Um, so there's. So I try for. Yeah. <laughs> so. There's the logo. Um, other questions? Logo related or not? There must be some. Mike. You're the longest serving Fedora leader. How you doing? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm doing all right, thanks. I think, so a lot of it is we set up this Oh, the, I am the longest serving Fedora leader. It's almost five years now, which um, is something like three times the normal. Um, <laughs> thank you. I'm glad people are clapping for that rather than booing, because that could have been the other way that went. Um, I think a lot of it is that we set up this structure like this, and I have Brian to help me, and Ben is a very active program manager, and the rest of the council, um, both to like help with a lot of the different things that are required to run a project this big. You know, like I said, you know, 4,000 people a year is 
crazy. Um, but also, like, so that I don't have to have all of the good ideas and I don't have to, like, we don't depend on me constantly innovating as the leader with the top down kind of thing. Um, that would be impossible and I'm not that smart. So we have this council where we have, you know, people coming in with objectives and all these different uh, areas which kind of help spread out the leadership to the community and we uh, think that structure has worked really well. Yeah, uh, Jim asked what my thoughts are on the Fedora desktop. Um, I think it's important. <laughs> um, spin more? What are you? Elaborate. Elaborate. Um, so uh, we have an initiative at Red Hat to put more resources into uh, making Fedora desktop um, the thing for Red Hat's uh, sort of desktop ecosystem in a way that it hasn't been before. Um, so I'm very excited about that. And we are going to be starting with, uh, we have uh, interns in, this is also bringing in the youth for Mike. Um, we have intern programs at Red Hat here in Brno and at the Boston office um, where we have, working with Boston University. And we are going to be working on focusing on making sure that um, we have a desktop offering that really appeals to those students. And um, from that, we're trying to build out relationships with some hardware vendors. So I hope that we'll be able to actually ship Fedora on hardware, like the XPS 13, um, for example, not necessarily the Dell ones. We were talking to other vendors as well. Um, not necessarily that model, but that kind of thing, um, so that we can get uh, Fedora desktop into the hands of more people. Yeah, Kevin. A provocative question. Okay, provocative uh, question from Kevin. So, Ready um, for it. So uh, it was uh, to do an off, uh, awesome, an awesome desktop experience for your students. Uh, do you think this is achievable with GNOME? Uh, yeah. Much any other <laughs> Kevin, who works on KDE, is uh, questioning whether it is achievable to have an awesome desktop uh, experience with GNOME. And the honest answer is uh, yes. I think it absolutely is. Uh, but I, it would be. It would also be possible with uh, with KDE, it would be possible with a, like, a lot of the modern Linux desktops are amazing and can have a good experience. And I know people have different preferences. Um, and I know uh, I, a lot of people love KDE, a lot of people love GNOME, and we have the resources to put it into, into GNOME, and that's, uh, that's why this is based around GNOME. But um, I, also, I also would like, having GNOME working well on these laptops should make it, the, the hardware enablement and these relationships will make it very easy for the KDE experience to also be really good on it, and I would like it to be easy for those people who prefer KDE to switch to it. Is that, is that, is that okay? <laughs> I got a little nod. Dan, Dan Walsh asked what we're gonna do about codecs. Uh, you know, MP3s can play fine now. We're, well, uh, we're, it's a waiting game. We're gonna. <laughs> <laughs> can we get IBM to buy all the patents? Can we get IBM to buy all the patents? Yes, that's the, we have this plan where Red Hat's gonna get acquired by a large company to whom this is not an issue. That's the, <laughs> yeah. Are we thinking about making the desktop like uh, very developer specific? For example, as a web developer, why should I choose Fedora over yeah, so the question is, uh, are we looking at making the desktop very developer specific? And uh, so that was kind of the idea with Fedora Workstation. We wanted something that would be developer specific, and we never really had the kind of the resources to um, make it that way. And there's just also, there's a lot of like basic, like do the codex work, does the machine boot work, that we didn't really have time to make developer specific things. Um, However, with, with the work we're working on right now, and again, you know, it's kind of focused on our developer interns as a, as a use case and like a focus group for it, um, I think that we will, uh, it won't necessarily be developer specific, but we want to have that developer experience be very, in, very for, uh, for, the, for the addition, the developer experience will be at the forefront and we really want to make it a smooth experience for that and Red Hat is interested in making sure that you know, there's a smooth experience for getting to OpenShift and kind of other uh, development tools in the open source Red Hat ecosystem. Um, Langdon. I was just going to say, is it on? Um, as uh, probably a likely lead of that because of my affiliation with Boston University and my heavy bias towards wanting that 
uh, I'm really looking forward to trying to subvert it into much more strongly developer focused workstation. Yeah. <laughs> That's my hope. Kevin, again. Yeah, one question about the developer orientation. Uh, uh, what kind of developers are we talking about now? Because the, right. the web developer needs very different tools from a C++ developer or from a C developer or even from a Go developer. Say. Mm. And so far, I think the focus has been mostly on tools for web developers or scripted language developers. So but but uh, I think... So I've actually been forgetting C++ and so and C developers. Right. So the, the yeah. So the question is basically when you say developer, that is not a one size fits all answer, right? And I am very aware of this problem. Um, I think with the university focus, it is likely that there it is going to be a lot of focus on like web development. But that said, a lot of the interns that will be working directly with like Red Hat engineers and the ones that are primarily based in the Boston office are a bunch of C and C++ programmers. So I think we'll actually see some of that. So of the of you know if you kind of knock it down a little bit, I would say like web developers, especially kind of and related to like OpenShift and that kind of deployment style, I think will will have a bias towards it because that's what we're going to have of people, right? And then the other side of that will probably be like C and C++, mostly because a lot of those guys are like graphics drivers people. Um, and so it'll be a little bit more focused on that. I think we will hopefully be, you know, I'm pretty cognizant of this problem, so I'll hopefully be trying to, to steer some of it or have some impact on trying to make it so that it's either generic or we say, hey, you know, this is what we're doing for this part or we're going to try and do it this way so that we can have a model where we can actually try to grow it for different um, different types of developers. But that, yeah, it's, I mean, it's a huge problem. There's not really much we can do about it except say, you know, yeah, we're going to tackle some aspects and hopefully it'll be good for everybody. Other, you know, or it'll be good for, like the big thing we want to do with the university students though is we want to go where they are rather than try to get them to come to us, right? So if they're doing web development, I'm going to try to make it a good web development experience for them, you know? Dan, again. Yeah, uh, are, is it going to be rolling updates or is it going to be release based? Uh, this, a, a lot of this comes down to what we can work out with hardware vendors to make them happy. And this also goes to kind of an LTS thing, um, although I try to avoid saying LTS because we don't really mean long like RHEL, we mean like four years at most. Um, and S. Well, and we don't even necessarily mean that, right? Yeah. I mean, we're expecting like our, the, the time between having to click the upgrade button which doesn't necessarily mean no new yeah. kernels, doesn't necessarily mean that it's all backwards compatible, it just yeah. means that you but don't we, have to we, do a reinstall. We need to, yeah, um, and the hardware vendors want to make sure that the thing keeps working even though we put out updates. And they, you know, I, they, they, in their ideal world, there would never be any updates ever, but um, they don't live in the ideal world, so there will be updates. Uh, and we have to figure out how to do that, and we have to figure out to, a way to do that in a way that doesn't put a burden on our maintainers who aren't interested in maintaining things for that aren't the latest, and we need to figure out good ways to do that. So can I add one bit to that before you're asking another question? It's just, um, I, I think we both actually, or at least a bunch of us, are interested in this potentially even being silver blue. Um, the problem is like from a developer experience perspective, it's like the worst case for silver blue. So, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, until somebody can start showing me why I'm not gonna bang my head against the wall using silver blue trying to do development, um, yeah. But, yeah. It, the other thing I, I'm interested in doing is as, as we have um, Merge Diskit from CentOS and Fedora, uh, possibly for this particular case of the hardware on laptops, actually building some of the solution from rebuilt CentOS packages or, um, you know, so that we can have those, those packages that are already being maintained, not doing, you know, some, somebody's already doing the work, uh, why do it twice? Kind, kind of things. We need to figure out how that will look, and that's uncharted territory as well. Uh, uh, for the, for the, this updating issue, uh, my, uh, Windows 10 deployed a solution where they just force everybody to update to their latest release every six months. Maybe we could do the same with previous. Yeah, right. <laughs> Kevin, <laughs> Kevin's comment is that Windows makes everybody update every six months now, so why do we have to be better than that? Well, right? we can be LTS and it's seven months. Yeah. <laughs> well, LTS will mean seven months now. Adam? Oh, sorry. Oh. Else? Yeah. Uh, where are we with rings 2.0 slash 3.0 slash 4.0 slash whatever iteration of rings we're up yeah, to Yeah, um, so uh, Paul, Fre no Paul Frields is the lifecycle objective fleet. Uh, and 
he is dying of the plague right now, as people do at this conference. I, I, he's, yeah, um, so. Did you I, ask the rings question last year? Yeah. They're, they're corollary. Um, yeah, so a lot of that, is, so, and that is kind of enabling work for some of this. Uh, this is like, where are we with rings, which has been my thing that I put on slides since 2013. Um, and there are no rings. There are, the, well, the, the general concept of letting us focus more on the core of the operating system, I really yeah. wish I could do that. Yeah, uh, the, the general concept of letting uh, QA, for example, focus more on the core of the operating system. So uh, the QA on the base OS. So, yeah, right. Yeah. So, so uh, yes, we don't need to call it rings. We can call it base OS. We can call it something else. So part, we, ha we have an objective that is uh, defining that base OS and figure out how that will work. So that is something we want to see in the next year, um, whether it will be rings or some other topographies to yeah. be determined. Would there be the return of the old core versus extra yeah. split with right. Right. So, uh, okay. Yeah, uh, right. We can't. We we already have a Fedora Core OS now, so right, that's yeah. taken. The question is, will that be the return of the Core and Extras split? I'm going to let Josh talk next, unless you want to answer that specific question. Uh, actually, since I want to ask Adam a question. What's yeah. preventing you from focusing on that now? You know the definition of it is one thing. Make one up. Well, I'm doing a QA guy. Figure out what you yeah. want. Yeah. Ask and test it. <laughs> <laughs> Josh says it's all Adam's fault. <laughs> Yeah. into CI, obviously. It's like it, you keep coming up against this thing of it would be easier to do this if we knew what were the central parts we really cared about. And, so, and to some extent, it's like you can't just define it in the code of Fedora because sometimes it would be like, well, the core should be this, but in the sad world we have, the core is this. Yeah, so and that needs fixing. I should have given you the mic for this. I mean, try, try and summarize. Yeah. Um, at, Adam says that this can't just be a QA problem because it touches so many things across the project. Um, and that also um, it's hard to, to define with Fedora as it exists right now because you can uh, define an ideal and then you get sad when you look at how that ideal relates to the reality. So we need to def maybe define an ideal and a way to strive towards it. I also want to address what Kevin said about isn't this just a return to the horrible uh, core versus extras split we had. Um, so. To me, uh, the core versus extras thing had two major parts. And one was there was a separate core repository and then extra stuff on top of it. I don't think that was a problem. The problem was that the core repository was, devi was developed behind the firewall and then dumped into the public. It dumped, and it, it didn't have the rigor that the extras repository did, which is uh, weird and backwards. Like the, uh, the better effort was put on the, on the outside of the circle. And yeah, and the inside was, only if you worked for Red Hat in specific roles could you touch it. And that was the thing that I think that was really the problem. Yeah, but the, um, there was a big problem that packages in Corp couldn't depend on packages in extras. Right. Or, or so other distros, at least uh, Ubuntu has the same problem with main and universe that sometimes they can't enable features because the dependencies are in universe. We had that with core and extras. And I think that this problem is coming back if we have Yeah, so the problem, the technical problem Kevin identifies is that packages in core um, can't depend on packages in the, the outer rings. It's kind of a one-way thing. Um, that can be a problem. I think uh, there are different ways to answer it. Uh, one way can be that we could actually have modules for some of those packages in core where there, there is a, a version of the package which only depends on things in the core, but there's an alternate stream of it which can be enabled which uh, depends on things outside of it. So there's, there's things we can do. Dennis has some things to I mean, do. So, some of that can also just be solved by looking at it not as a absolute, you know, the core is this core and it's built as a core, but you, ha you build everything in a big bucket, and then the distribution, the way you carve it up when you deliver, can split things out, which is something that in the core and extras you couldn't do because core was built over here and you know, extras was built over here and never the two shall meet. Be when, you, we, when you can bring them together, you can do different things to solve the problems, enabling things like you know, extra functionality to be built in a sub package that is not part of the core and is shipped elsewhere. But we also, we're talking about 
different concepts here that we're conflating, right? One is about how do we separate what we ship and how we define things as we see it as a user. And one, what I heard from Adam was, what do I focus on as the core? What is, like, what is important? I think with, with CI, we have what, we, what it takes to really define that organically. It's not about let's go out and try to define what we really define as the core, but it's about what am I willing to, to gate on, right? Mm -hmm. so when we, as, as we define that relation, and that's, that's not something we, we, can, we can impose on everyone, right? That's, we have to agree as a community on certain things and say, for example, I, we all agree that the system should boot, things like that. If we have those stories, those, those core concepts, then I think that is, that is also part of the def definition of what the core is, and that has to evolve and automatically everyone who contributes code contributes to that definition. So I think that's a, a, a lot more organic way of, of uh, growing that definition. I think we had a question. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that in Rel 8 beta, we actually have, can you hear me? Okay. In Rel 8 beta, we have an initial attempt at doing this split and it's not about who can do what, it's just about being able to apply different policies to the, the different content sets. So if you're looking for a starting place, have a look at it. It's not final, it's not perfect, but you have to start somewhere and then iterate. I think it, 10 minutes ago it might have been a different topic, but uh, <laughs> so yeah, I think, I mean, to, to add to what Dominic said, I think we, we should define the core or the, the, the stuff that is being tested functionally. Yeah. And we already okay. kind of have the definition of this that you wrote, right? So let's just say that everything that influences the beta criteria matters and everything else is outside. And yeah. So we're, we're talking about, I mean, Dominic said we should define it in terms of what needs to work. Um, and sorry, I'm blanking on who you are. I do know, but Zvishek, I'm sorry. I knew, I knew who you were. <sighs> like I said, no sleep. Zvishek points out that we have this already. We have the Fedora release criteria, which is what, which is, which does this. It defines the things that Fedora is required to do. Um, and that's great. And that's a good starting point. Um, there's two two kind of problems there in that the criteria cover a hell of a lot of stuff. Um, just the stuff that we are required to care about by the criteria, the, there's a lot of it. There's two desktops in it, which is twice as many desktops as Rel8 Beta has, for instance. And then um, it's we don't have a focus on paring down what goes into the products that we produce to meet those requirements, right? So the requirement is the workstation must do blah, 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 and KDE must do blah, 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 blah. If you look at what's in workstation and what's in KDE especially, it's the kitchen sink. It's huge. So I mean, the way you would go about doing this, the way we should go about doing this properly is that we should have a system that knows what goes into each of our key deliverables, right? This should all be tracked. Exactly, a product definition center would be a great way to do it. Um, that should all be tracked so that we, you know, systems can know instead of there being a big list somewhere, these are the important packages, or a comps file which says these are the important packages, it should be what goes into what, and this should all be tracked up and down the tree. But we should also, when we have that, we should have some kind of focus on making that as small as possible to achieve the things we want to achieve. And if something is not achieving one of those things, then being able to say, okay, that's less important is kind of where I hope we could go with it. So, yeah, it, it seems to me that the, the core should be the, the minimum viable bootable set for, for the architectures we support, right? That seems like that is the simplest way and just keep it as absolutely small and condensed as possible because these are the things that must work. It doesn't necessarily fulfill all the missions of Fedora, but that is a definable set. It shouldn't change. It shouldn't really grow or shrink a ton over time and it would make it easier to sh just get this done. So in what context does it have to boot? Or what architecture? Well, that's what I'm saying. Well, that's I agree. It, it must be all of those for sure. All the supported architectures for sure. That's why you keep it real small. Because yes. On the cloud, on the desktop, on the laptop, with firmware. You start talking about Nelson Cade on your 
It's also, I think, I think the other thing too is if we go back to the new charter, right, is that it's also a, a measure or a separation of responsibilities, right, in a sense, is that the, what Fedora, the the you know project promises is this really small set of things to boot or whatever we decide what it is, right? But then we move the responsibility of defining, okay, what is a GNOME desktop experience to the GNOME desktop edition team, right? And then they are responsible for making sure that you know they're delivering that thing. Adam, the human, may be doing some or a lot of both. <laughs> He but will it, be, <laughs> but it, it's it becomes it shifts the responsibility of making that decision. First of all, off QE. Second, off of trying to define you know the difference between. I mean, this I, you keep hitting on this, but I would hit on it a lot more, which is that Fedora is a project, not an operating system, right? And we need to stop treating all the things that we want to deliver as one thing, right? And so we don't need you know the desktop team, you know, or let's say sorry, the uh, like the KDE team, right, or the uh, GNOME team or whatever, they know what they think is important to deliver the experience they want to deliver. And if they don't, it's still their problem. <laughs> right? So I just want to keep hitting that again. Do you have a mic or go ahead? Or? Well, I, I was just going to you should really read the post that the council put out from its Hackfest for more on how these teams and all can work and what Langdon's saying, because that definitional component is critical. And when you start to look at things like CI, those teams will one day, I don't want to commit for you, be able to say, hey, we're building the XFCE desktop, and here's all of our requirements. And we may not gate every package in every case against those requirements, but everybody gets their information in advance. And that's all well explicated in that, that post. So please, please also beat on Matthew to write the follow-ups. So uh, I would like to point out that, in fact, we actually we already have some kind of definition of packages that are um, core packages that are, that are important to test, and that's the critical path packages. But it's that. But yeah. 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 But, but the thing is, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Another the thing, uh, just the thing is, I think this the, the, this list is actually smaller than what we are talking about now, and still is already suffering from the problem that I was describing in that uh, with the with the dependencies because it, it, it then it drags in all the transitive dependencies and build dependencies and even the build dependencies for the other sub packages and so. And so then you end up, uh, I mean, this is not, not the very latest example, but uh, at, at some point we had, we wanted to have KDM uh, as critical, but KDM is a sub package of KDE workspace, and KDE workspace built requires on Akonadi, and uh, Akonadi dragged in MySQL, and so MySQL <laughs> ended up in a critical path without anybody actually wanting to do that, and this kind of things, this is exactly what, what, what I'm saying, that without losing features or split or building the same source starboard multiple times, it's it's hard to split it. Yeah. Uh, I, uh, just because it's hard doesn't mean we shouldn't try, number one, right? Um, right, but I think right now, I think one of the problems with that is that the, the people who know the most about what it should be doing are far away from the people who are doing it, right? Um, and so that's why, I th like I said, it's separation of responsibilities more, right? It's like you have to know how every single deliverable of Fedora works in order for you to be comfortable with the testing that's done on the superset, right, um, or or fail, right? Like so, that's that seems like a separation of responsibilities problem. We need to decompose that. You know, you, you know, in the abstract, um, you know, are the core person, right? And you're responsible for this set. And then the, like I said, the KDE group is responsible for the set that they care about, right? And the core OS set, and the container set, and the cloud set, and the, you know, and all of those could be separation of responsibilities. If we had people who were close to the problem via things like CI, 
responsible for um, how they're delivering the things that they deliver and the things that they care about, then they can do things like break up um, you know, uh, transitive dependencies or other kinds of dependencies right, that are dragging in things that they shouldn't. We can have, with modules, right, we can have actually different sets of available RPMs depending on which edition you want to ship that doesn't drag in something you don't want to drag in. Like, I think we have a lot more flexibility on actually, uh, you know, did you put the charter up? I was hoping you were going to put the charter up. Mm. Fail. Um, but the end of the charter basically we says we want to enable um, you know, Fedora members to kind of deliver for their users, right? We have, we're starting to get the tools between the modularity and the lifecycle stuff, and you know, we're starting to get the tools that that's actually doable, like executable, and while it's getting executable, we need to start to shift the responsibility onto executing it that way so that they can be responsible for whatever it is they want to deliver. And our classic example, what was it, the, uh, the sheep shearing yeah, company? Right. So I've got herders. a different example because, okay. because um, I don't think they're in the stream here. Uh, uh, there are people from a large social media company that is easily confused with our logo <laughs> who uh, do a cool thing where they take um, CentOS packages and then they use Rawhide Systemd and a bunch of other things to build their own kind of custom solution for their needs. Uh, they're doing that off in their own world, in their own infrastructure. It would be super awesome if they could come to Fedora and do that in Fedora and also not generate more work for Adam, but at the same time, like do their packaging and do put their branches in our diskit. It, would, it wouldn't impact your uh, critical path thing. No, it would make it easier. But it would be... Because uh, they would be contributing to right, it. Right, they would be contributing back and then they, they would be able to uh, pull, you know, pull things out fork back and forth, um, it would be awesome. Jim is looking really worried. <laughs> uh, we want you to do more work, Jim. Yeah, uh, I think that would be awesome. It would be really a, uh, they, they could deliver that solution um, for themselves uh, using our using our tools and um, in our space. Jim, can you turn around and make that face at the camera? Yeah. <laughs> for posterity? Um, I, I was uh, kind of hoping that we would not talk about this particular thing until we had, you know, Documentation and testing and possibly validation. Just because it's hard doesn't mean you shouldn't start. Right? right? <laughs> oh, this thing up here. You're talking about this, or are you talking? About, oh, yeah, this is okay. We'll talk about oh, this later then. Okay. I, I won't show. He's making a face at what's on my on the screen here. Uh, I want to point out this shirt here and put you on the spot. This is why we need the logo redesigned. Uh, <laughs> Right yeah. yeah, right, like, um, wow. Like, we can't print our own logo on blue and have it look like our logo from, like, I, you have to come, like, right up to you and make you uncomfortable in order to see that it is our logo. Um, so, anyways. Okay, I'm not allowed to talk about this thing on the screen, Jim. We've got... No, please not yet. Okay, there's a thing that we're not allowed to talk about yet, but it's going to be awesome. Don't write that URL down. <laughs> <laughs> So Adam. I just, I just wanted to follow up quickly on the ring thing. And yeah. Quickly, it became very personal about me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the discussion about the rings thing quickly became very personal about me and QA, but that was I wasn't. Fault. Yeah, that's Josh's fault. I wasn't solely aiming at that, but there's also the problem of we have 50, 100,000 packages in Fedora, and we're packaging like huge parts of JavaScript. Um, you know, ecosystems, which does anyone ever use any of those packages for anything? And it just makes me think we have all of this stuff and some of it needs to be not part of the whole conglomerate. It need, there needs to be more differentiation going yeah. on. So uh, one of the things, a lot of that stuff, like the node packages and things, w when there are upstream, maybe node's a scary example because their ecosystem <laughs> is, is frightening. I know, but but, it still but yeah, a pile right. of stuff. Yeah, uh, Rust is a good example. Yeah. And th there's basically each of these language ecosystems have a way that they work at managing their source code, their libraries, their dependencies, those kind of things. And what we do is we take their thing and translate it into our thing and call it adding value. Um, and sometimes it is, and it definitely was 15 years ago when everything was terrible. But um, some of these things are actually getting pretty good. You know, Node may be terrible, but the Rust ecosystem is pretty great. Um, For Rust, it makes sense because you're compiled. Yeah, <laughs> okay, well, yeah, right. so compiled maybe is a difference there. Um, but Node is much, much better. It actually does vulnerability yeah, testing. Right, so Node is actually, they're um, learning painfully from their mistakes as well. <laughs> um, 
and you're it's still ten these. minutes. Nice. Um, it was. I thought it was ten minutes, like ten minutes ago. I don't know how this t time works. You have um, these four dependencies. So yeah. I no. Um, but I've. I, I, yeah. So I'm looking at um, like uh, doing IoT stuff for my house. There's a project called Home Assistant, which is very popular, um, and it's a Python thing, which should be easy to package up in Fedora theoretically, but. You know, the upstream actually releases a Docker image that they build of their thing, you know, automatically, and that's like their. Su oh, I'm sorry, Dan Walsh tells me, do not say that word. Uh, they may call it a Docker image, Dan, so you have to go yell at them. They release an, a container image in some popular format. Um, that is what they support as their image, and they, you know, they maintain that if there's problems with it, like there's that that's their tree, and so if we would. If we were, for example, to take all of those Python things, make them into RPMs, package them up, and then make a Fedora container image from it, um, I don't think, I, I could go through all that work. I know how to do it, but I would really like question whether I'm adding any value. I've just now made an alternate stream for this that is less supported, is confusing to the upstream, and doesn't, uh, so, I don't know, we need to find a better way to work with those things, and I don't have the answer to that, but like I said, I don't have to have all the answers, so <laughs> somebody come to the council and solve this for me. Yeah. The problem with the third party packaging systems is that, that, that uh, they typically, uh, it doesn't interact very well with system package things, and, and sometimes you need system package libraries, especially for Python. Yeah, so they, they don't interact very well with system package things in the upstream, so yeah, that's uh, there's problems for sure. But if you come on. in a container, you don't care. And can we imagine that uh, Fedora con uh, container that will release is not installed software based on RPMs, but for example on the node module or Python? Yeah, can, can we imagine making Fedora containers that uh, don't depend on RPMs but are made um, from the upstream source trees? Yes, I can definitely imagine that. <laughs> um, it, that sounds <laughs> very easy to imagine. Um, <laughs> right, I am. Yeah. Um, and I think there's also like cases where um, you know, we're talk talking to the you know, people making flat packs. Um, and right now we've got an awesome system around people went to Owen's talk that takes existing Fedora RPMs and makes flat packs out of them automatically, almost automatically. Um, which is neat and will be a, a way for us to like seed that Flatpak <coughs> ecosystem with trusted packages very easily. But um, that is also going through this extra hoop that doesn't really provide a lot of value there and actually causes some problems. So it would actually be nice to be able to go from source to Flatpak, source to uh, other container images, source to OCI. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I think that would be a great thing for us to move into in the future because that's where the world is going and if we're keeping trying to put people into our square pegs or whatever we want to call it. Um, yeah, right? I know. It's a very uncomfortable. <laughs> They're not shaped that way. <laughs> you want to call it here? Yeah, okay. Uh, I, everybody's walking away, so I think... I think well, the party's, the party's there's a party. The game, the game yeah. talk, the closing talk is intended. Okay. So, I think so seats, maybe use the uh, all right. Thank you for coming, everybody, and uh, I'll see you in Budapest.